Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Science, and today I want to talk about the idea of representation. This is another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. What is a representation? In the familiar Euclidean space, when we want to do some mathematics with vectors, we have to represent these vectors in a particular basis. The physics of the problem is independent of the representation that we choose, but the mathematics can be made much simpler if we choose a good representation. An example from Euclidean space is if we have a system that looks the same in all directions, that means it has spherical symmetry. In that case, we could solve the problem using Cartesian coordinates, but the solution would be tedious and obscure. Instead, if we use spherical coordinates, then the solution is transparent and simple. Exactly the same happens in quantum mechanics. Different representations lead to exactly the same physics, but choosing a good representation can make the mathematics much simpler. So what is the objective of this video? I will introduce the mathematical language of representations in quantum mechanics. So let's go! Representations in quantum mechanics are a fundamental tool because they allow us to go from the abstract ideas of state space to the concrete mathematics that allows us to solve actual quantum mechanical problems. In state space, we define a representation through an orthonormal basis that spans the full space. This means that the first question we need to ask is, what is a basis? To answer this question, we start by choosing a set of kets ui, which are orthonormal. What this means is that the bracket between ui and uj is delta ij. Then the set of kets u forms an orthonormal basis if for every ket psi that belongs to the state space v, there is a unique expansion psi equals sum over i ci ui. What does this mean? Just like in the familiar Euclidean vector space we typically write vectors in a particular basis, for example the Cartesian xy basis, in state space we can also write states in a basis, in this case the u basis. The ci are the expansion coefficients. What we need to do to find them is to first project the state psi on a basis ket uj, we then write out psi in the ui basis, we can then move the uj term inside the sum, and we obtain sum over i, ci, and then the bracket between uj and ui. As we're working with an orthonormal basis, then this bracket is simply delta ij, which means that the only term that is non-zero in the sum is cj. So what does this mean? This is telling us that to find the expansion coefficient c of a state psi on a particular basis u, all we have to do is to project the state psi onto the basis states u. So let's ask again, what is a representation of a state? We can write out a ket psi in a basis u in terms of expansion coefficients c, and we call the set of coefficients c the representation of the ket psi in the u basis. I already mentioned that a basis in a state space is analogous to a basis in the familiar Euclidean space. This is no coincidence. Both state space and Euclidean space are vector spaces with analogous properties. What I want to do now is to make this analogy explicit using a two-dimensional Euclidean space as an example. We start by drawing the unit vectors x hat and y hat on the coordinate axis, and these two vectors form our basis in the two-dimensional Euclidean space. These vectors form an orthonormal basis, as I am writing down here in terms of the dot product. In this analogy, the x hat y hat basis vectors are equivalent to the ui basis kets, and these orthonormality relations are equivalent to the bracket above giving the orthonormality condition for the u-kets. We can extend our analogy to compare the representation of vectors to the representation of kets. Consider a vector r, whose components in the xy coordinates are a and b. We know that r is equal to a x hat plus b y hat in the xy basis. We also know that to obtain the expansion coefficients, we project the vector r on the basis vectors, so x hat dot r gives this, and then using the orthonormality of the basis, we obtain a. We can similarly obtain b by projecting r on y hat. What we have here is that the r vector is analogous to the ket psi and the expansion in the xy basis is analogous to the expansion in the u basis. Now, how do we obtain the expansion coefficients? The a and b coefficients are given by the projection of the vector onto the basis vectors calculated using the scalar or dot product. By comparison, the c expansion coefficients are given by the projection of the ket onto the basis states, and this is what the scalar product looks like in the Dirac notation. 
Going back to state space, the next idea I want to introduce is that of a closure relation. To do that, we start with a ket psi and write it down in the u basis, but this time we write the expansion coefficient as the bracket between u and psi rather than as the c parameters. We still remember that this bracket is a scalar, so we can move it to the other side of the basis kets, and this allows us to rewrite the whole expression like this. To make this rearrangement even more explicit, we write down a parenthesis around the sum over i, and we can take psi outside the parenthesis because it doesn't explicitly depend on i. The question we can ask now is, what is this parenthesis? If you have seen my video on operators, you will immediately recognize this as an operator written as an outer product. So now the question becomes, what does this operator do? To answer this, let's compare the cat here at the beginning with this final expression here. It looks like the operator is doing nothing to the cat. What this means is that the operator is the identity operator, the operator that leaves the cat invariant. I can therefore write the identity operator as the sum over i of the outer product of the basis states u. This result is what we call a closure relation, or also a resolution of the identity. And in this case, it is the resolution of the identity in the u basis. Before we move on, I want to remark that this is a very important result that we will use all the time, and you will see how we use it multiple times already in the rest of this video. Now that we know how to represent cats in a particular basis, the next question is how do we represent bras? To answer this, let's consider a bra psi that belongs to the dual space V star. We can write the bra as equal to psi and then the identity operator, and we can then write out the resolution of the identity operator in the U basis. As psi doesn't explicitly depend on i, we can insert it into the summation, and if we do that, we obtain this expression here. We see that this is an expression for the bra psi in terms of the basis bras u, and that the expansion coefficients are the brackets between psi and u. If we look at these expansion coefficients, we can use the conjugation property of the scalar product to rewrite them like this, and then comparing this expression with that of the expansion coefficients above, we can write it as ci star. What is this telling us? If we have a ket psi that we write in the u basis in terms of the expansion coefficient c, which in turn are given by the bracket between u and psi, then we can write the corresponding bra psi in terms of the corresponding bras u, as shown here, and in this case the expansion coefficients are the complex conjugates of the expansion coefficients of the ket. After kets and bras, the next thing we want is the representation of operators. Remember that an operator A is a mathematical object that acts on a ket psi to deliver another ket psi prime. Our starting point is to write out both psi and psi prime kets in the u basis. For psi, we write the same expression we have already written multiple times, and for psi prime, we write an analogous expression, and we call the expansion coefficients c prime and they are given by the bracket between the basis states u and the corresponding state psi prime. To figure out what the representation of an operator is, we start by copying the expression for ci prime. We then use the definition of psi prime as a acting on psi. Then we insert the identity operator after the a operator. And then we write down the resolution of the identity in the u basis. None of the terms outside this parenthesis depend explicitly on j, so we can move the summation to the beginning of the expression, and we obtain this final rearrangement here, giving sum over j, matrix element of a with respect to ui and uj, and then bracket uj psi. What we have here is an expression for ci prime that depends on the operator a. We can replace the ci prime above by this expression we have just found, and doing this we obtain that psi prime equals this long expression here. The final step is to move the ui basis ket to the beginning, and we can do this because the other two terms are simply scalars. We can then rewrite this whole expression like this, where we can take the psi outside the parentheses because it doesn't explicitly depend on either i or j. So what is this result telling us? We see that the term in parentheses is acting on the ket psi and giving the ket psi prime. This is exactly what the operator a does, so the term in parentheses is the operator A. We're done. We can write an operator A in a basis U as the sum over ij 
of Aij multiplying the outer product of Ui and Uj, where Aij is the matrix element of A with respect to Ui and Uj. What we have here is that the numbers Aij represent the operator A in the U basis, just like the numbers C represent the ket psi in the U basis. As an example of an operator written in a particular basis, we can consider the resolution of the identity which I introduced earlier. We found that we can write the identity operator as the sum over the outer products of all basis states. The question is, is this consistent with the representation of operators up here? To answer the question, we consider the matrix elements of the identity operator, which are ui identity operator uj, we know that the identity operator leaves a ket invariant, so we get the bracket between ui and uj, and it is simply delta ij because of the orthonormality of the basis. Putting this together, the identity operator is represented by this general expression. Replacing the matrix elements here by the expression we just found for them here, we obtain this expression, and then the delta ij reduces the double sum to a single sum as shown here. Comparing this result to the original resolution of the identity, we confirm that they are the same. To finish, I want to generalize representations from a discrete basis labeled by a discrete index i to continuous basis, which are labeled by a continuous index alpha. The generalization is pretty straightforward, and it amounts to replacing Kronecker delta functions of two discrete variables with the Dirac delta function of two continuous variables, and sum over discrete indices by integrals over continuous indices. The first concept I want to discuss is that we work with an orthonormal basis. In the continuous case, we write the orthonormality relation as v alpha v beta equals the Dirac delta function of alpha minus beta. As claimed earlier, all we're doing is replacing the Kronecker delta function with the Dirac delta function. At this point, I can imagine that the mathematicians amongst you will not really like this. In physics, we do know that the Dirac delta function should only appear under the integral sign, and we really only use it under the integral sign. However, it is very convenient for discussions to write it like this, and this is what I will do. The next concept I want to look at is the expansion of a ket in a particular basis. We extend this to the continuous case by writing it as an integral over d alpha of c alpha v alpha, where the expansion coefficients now become functions of the continuous variable. And you can see that all we do is essentially replacing the sum over i with an integral over alpha. In this case, I will rederive the expression for the expansion coefficients to convince you that we only ever use the Dirac delta function under an integral sign. To do that, I start with the bracket between v beta and psi. Then I insert the expansion of psi in the v alpha basis. I then rearrange the expression then I replace the bracket between basis states with the corresponding delta function, and as promised, the delta function only appears under the integral sign, and finally we can evaluate the integral to obtain the expansion coefficient, c beta. The final thing I want to look at is the representation of an operator in a particular basis. This also generalizes to an expression in terms of integrals, and the expansion coefficients are now functions of two variables, alpha and beta. Again, all we're doing is replacing sums with integrals. The reason I have gone in some detail over this is because both discrete and continuous bases are important in quantum mechanics. To give you an example, a much used discrete basis is that associated with the spin of quantum particles, and a much used continuous basis is that associated with the position of quantum particles. In fact, you have probably heard about the latter one, because it is the basis that leads to the idea of wave functions. In any case, you can find examples of both these bases in action in some of my other videos linked in the description. To wrap up, I want to ask again the question of why do we care about representations? The physics of the problem is independent of the representation that we use to solve it. So the reason we care about representations is because choosing a good representation can greatly simplify both the maths and the conceptual understanding of the problem. And so a lot of the time that you will spend solving quantum mechanical problems will be dedicated to finding the best representation. So what have we learned? We have introduced the idea of representations in quantum mechanics. Representations are necessary for a practical solution of quantum mechanical problems. So we're going to use them all the time. You can see how to do this in other videos in the section what next in the description. As a teaser, check out the video on wave functions, which correspond to the position representation of a quantum state. 
If you liked the video or you would like to send me suggestions for future videos, please subscribe.